Hey y'all, it's Beth. Welcome back to my channel. We are going to talk about everything I DNF'd in September. Everything I did not read. <laughs> I don't know what happened. It's actually even, I DNF'd four, I read four, I'm in the middle of a ninth and I'm nowhere near done with it. So it's going to move itself into October, but I need to finish it so that I can start reading more October-y types of things and I thought about doing all the DNFs at the top or all the DNFs at the bottom and all the ones I've finished but I think I'm just gonna do them in order so you can see the wild progression of my brain and the things that I decided I wasn't going to read and this isn't the right order <laughs> so I didn't even write them down here in the right order I came into the month reading known of the ninth and it's all the way down here on fourth yeah no. sometimes the brain just doesn't function like you want it to function so Nona the Ninth, her city is under siege and the zombies are coming back. All she wants is a birthday party and each night Nona dreams of a woman with a skull painted face. Here's my review of Nona the Ninth, some of my favorite quotes. And that's about all I can tell you. Other than the Locked Tomb series continues to be one of the most wackadoodle things I've ever read in my entire life, and yet I can't get enough. I love it so much. Now, for me, Nona's the weakest one thus far, but it still gave it four stars. I gave the other two five. I gave this one four. Gideon continues to be my favorite favorite. And I have gleaned enough off of the interwebs to really realize that Nona the Ninth is a bridge. It's a bridge between Harrow the Ninth and the upcoming Electo the Ninth. Sometimes a bridge book is hard to write, but as long as she maintains her complete wackadoodle <laughs> brain in how she writes these books, we're just going to keep reading them. Those of us who love the strange and the unusual. I mean, Tamsin Muir pretty much breaks all the rules, all of them, when it comes to the books that she's writing. And I don't know who decided to publish Gideon the Ninth the first time around, but dang, I'm grateful. I'm grateful. So I started off strong. Started off strong. And then we're going to back up to this page because then I made it 50% of the way through the unmaking of June Pharaoh. June must unravel her family's curse and solve her mother's mysterious disappearance in a small North Carolina town haunted by secrets. She crosses the threshold of reality, risking everything to alter her family's fate and find true love. Now, what I can say, now that I've DNF'd this long before Hurricane Helene, is that that same little North Carolina town may not be there right now. So, thoughts for everybody in North Carolina trying to get out of unbury from survive the aftermath of that hurricane that's never meant to take out cities in the mountains y'all hurricanes are coastal and this would just you know what i'm saying think about everybody in north carolina and everywhere else that was affected by Helene because it's just nightmarish when you see pictures of a major interstate just completely washed out I've driven that interstate on the border of Tennessee and North Carolina. It's a beautiful drive. Not anymore. Not anymore. Anyway, I put something on Goodreads along the lines of June Farrow's internal dialogue is excruciating. And that pretty much sums up how I feel because the whole book is about her. We're always in her head and I just couldn't listen to it anymore. Just couldn't listen to it anymore. And that's why I DNF'd it. I'm amazed I made it to 50%. And then I started getting generous on what I was going to put up with and what I wasn't going to put up with. And then I put up with one that I shouldn't have put up with because I felt guilty for DNFing all the books that I was DNFing. So moving on from there is the cartographers. In Cartographers, Nell Young discovers that an old gas station map holds incredible value and a deadly secret, setting her on a dangerous journey to uncover her family's hidden past. Despite its imaginative premise and potential for mystery, I didn't find the story compelling enough to finish. It really, there were so many plot holes right up at the top. Right up at the top. Nell is 
estranged from her father, kind of for good reason. He passes away. She's still in touch with other people that worked with him at the New York Library, where she's always wanted to work. This whole map thing happens. It's in his possessions, and she finds it, and she starts trying to investigate it. And then she miraculously pops up and attends his funeral, which she didn't have any hand in even planning, from what we can tell. And like, he's dead. Would you not want to just step in and kind of help plan your father's funeral instead of... I don't know. And one text to an ex-boyfriend and he's racing back into her life after years and years. Like, I did... No. <laughs> this is not how relationships work. None of them. None of the interpersonal relationships in this story work. <laughs> just not a one. And I have this huge affinity for maps. I collect globes. I just love them. And I really wanted to like this book. Uh, it's been on my shelf for a long time. What I should say, also, I have been putting forth a concerted effort to tackle my backlist because my goals back here say that I need to read 10 books off of my backlist. I can now check this off, but most of them were DNFs. <laughs> Here's Unmaking of June Farrow. Here's Cartographers. This was a conscious decision of something I was going to try to do in September. Uh, it's too bad I don't do reading vlogs because it would have been a good one. And I was just like, I'm going to I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to tackle this backlist situation because I had only read, what, three books, I think, on my backlist when I came into September and I was determined to see what I could do. And boy, wow, it was difficult. <laughs> okay, moving on. And the next one that I did read and finish because it's also on my backlist is Gods of Jade and Shadow by Silvia Morena Garcia. I picked this up on my book crawl in April, maybe even of last year, for Independent Bookstore Day. It's the first time I've read Sylvia Moreno Garcia. And I was wholly expecting, because of all of the buzz on the internet, to go into this and come out with it a five star. It's probably rated a four star just because it just didn't hit home. Like, I just thought it was going to. You know, and different people who read the same things as you read or rating things five stars and you just expect it to be a five star. And no, it knocked it down a peg for me. But in the Gods of Jade and Shadow, Cassiopeia Toon's mundane life is transformed when she accidentally releases the spirit of the Mayan god of death, setting off a thrilling quest to reclaim his throne. Silvia Moreno Garcia masterfully blends the Jazz Age with rich Mayan mythology, taking readers on an unforgettable journey through Mexico's vibrant landscapes and the depth of the underworld. Now, what I can say is that I absolutely love the fact that she chose to set this in the Jazz Age, like in the 20s and the 30s. And that was just perfect on her decision-making paradigm. I don't know why she decided to do that, but it was just a great, great era to set this in especially to have that jazz age era from a Mexican point of view, you know, where they're looking at American stars and the flappers and the haircuts and so much of that culture crossover is talked about. And I really enjoyed that. I also very much enjoyed the folklore. Y'all know I'm on a folklore kick. <laughs> so I really loved getting this background of a little bit of the Mayan folklore as well. Part of what knocked it down a peg for me was the hint at romance. And it was just another one of those immortal being lived forever with a young girl kind of situations. Which sometimes I can forgive and sometimes I can't. Because, you know, there's always, like, when it comes to the vampire side of things, you then think, well, well, how old were you when you were turned into a vampire? Because if you were of age when you were turned into a vampire... And then you still have to look at that situation because, like, Edward and Bella, sure, might have been close in theoretical age, uh, but I have far more issues with that relationship than Edward's age. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's just, 
You gotta take all the things into account. The other thing that I'm, I hesitate to say this, and yet I'm going to say it. Gods of Jade and Shadow came first, and then this year, Lee Bardugo released The Familiar. There are so many similarities between these two works. And a lot of the things that, like I gave The Familiar three stars because it was just fine. A lot of the things were done so much better in this one. There's a lot of parallels, despite the fact that one was set in Spain in, you know, the, the 1700s or the 1800s, and this one is set in Mexico in the early 1900s. There's so many parallels between these two books. If you read them back to back, because I guess I've read them close enough, because I read The Familiar earlier this year. But if you were to read them back to back, it would give you pause. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I'm gonna move on to the next one, which is Lies of a Jingo first, before I started DNF other things. Yes. <laughs> In this book, Tutu embarks on a perilous quest to save his mother and his city from the oppressive Ajungo Empire where cutting out tongues is a grim rite of passage. Utomi crafts an enchanting and thought-provoking fable set in a vibrant yet harsh world, exploring themes of sacrifice, heroism, and the quest for survival. I loved all 87 pages of this little novella. I oh, did. Do we even call it a novella? Is it a short story at this point? It's in a book. It's bound. I loved it enough that I've already bought the second one, and I'm eyeballing the third one. I put it on my release radar for next year. <laughs> it is set in Africa, obviously. Moses is the son of immigrants, Nigerian immigrants. And I love the folklore elements that are in this, although I don't think they're native folklore. They just feel like it. Just feels like a fable. Feels like a folklore. The way he tells it sounds like the way different African people groups share their stories. I should know. I grew up with them. So. And that's probably why I love it. Like it just has that whole feel of this tale has been told around the fireside for generations and generations and generations. And of course it is set in what is clearly a fictional Sahara kind of situation and you know the desert can be a scary scary place i just very much appreciated it and i wrote i'm immediately buying the next one it's short I, I read it in two days just because i read them on my lunch break so i read like 40 pages on one lunch break and 40 pages on another lunch break oh because it is so tiny it's one of those books that i've wanted for a year and however long and I just couldn't get myself to pay full price for an 87-page book. <laughs> yes. I realize the whole cost of traditional publishing is really where all of that comes in. Getting your ISBN number, having a book bound, you know, all of that is where the fact that an 87-page book costs the same as a 350-page book. But it still just kind of drives me a little crazy. One fun thing... In the day between, where I had it in my purse and read it for lunch this day, and I had it in my purse and I read it for lunch this day, that evening in between the two was my Bring Your Own Book Club. And somebody showed up there and brought the second one to talk about. And when he pulled out that book, I went, oh, I said, I'm reading the first one right now. It's in my purse in my car. Like, it is in the parking lot of this library. And so he was, so we had a good conversation about this book. And he was like, I really need you to read the other one before you come to book club next time. And I forgot to mention that I actually have the unmaking of June Pharaoh and cartographers both in physical format because they were book of the month picks. So I was doing a hybrid of the book and the audiobook. It didn't help either way. So let's move on to the next one. All right, so the next one that I DNF, so I don't have it on here, is When a Crocodile Eats the Sun, a memoir of Africa by Peter Godwin. 
I don't remember where I got this book. It was at a used bookstore. You can tell it's a little bit on the older side. In When a Crocodile Eats the Sun, Peter Godwin chronicles the emotional journeys back to Zimbabwe amidst the country's descent into chaos. The memoir reveals the complexities of family loyalty and the impact of political turmoil. While it offers a poignant exploration of resilience and love, it also raises questions about the author's perspective on privilege and the broader implications of colonial legacies in Africa. And that last sentence is wholly mine. It doesn't come from any kind of a summary. Yes, while Zimbabwe went through a terrible civil war and there was a dictator who was directly involved in decimating the country, there were also a lot of what I'm going to call white Africans because they'd been there for generations. And at that point, colonialism aside, they are African, and many of them were run out of the country. Through all of that, though, I think Peter Godwin loses sight of, like my sentence said, his perspective on privilege. And that's difficult. It's a fine line. He's also very repetitive, by the way. <laughs> Just in writing style. The number of times he started a sentence with, when I grew up in Africa kind of some variation of like we know you don't have to tell us that anymore and it really was sort of the distastefulness of some of his perspective that I couldn't finish it just couldn't finish it and it's one of those things that as I've gotten older like I distinctly try to remember that what I think of as my Kenya no longer exists I haven't lived there for 30 years my Kenya no longer exists. Some version of my Kenya still exists, but it has moved on without me. And I know that. And while I was not born there, I was six months old when I first landed in Kenya. So my parents had already lived there for four years before. And then I came along. It's touchy. I still, I love my Kenya, but I can't, I can't vote there. I'm not a citizen. I haven't lived there for 30 years. These are all things you just need to distinctly be aware of. And when writing this book, Peter Godwin lives in New York City. Lives in New York City. He and his family still, I think, live in New York City. So I got to grab another book that I forgot to pick up and put next to me. Okay, the fourth book <laughs> I DNF'd was Age of Vice by Deepti Kapoor. Another book of the month pick. Not looking good for book of the month right now. Age of Vice unfolds in New Delhi, where a tragic accident involving a wealthy family sets off a dark and intricate tale of power, corruption, and intertwined lives. Despite its compelling premise and rich setting, I struggled to engage with the story due to its numerous trigger warnings, ultimately stepping away during a particularly distressing scene. So, there is a lot of reality in here. Other than The Adventures of Amina El Sarafi, this is probably the book of the month book I looked forward to reading the most. I was really excited by it. I love Indian culture. Like if I could move to India, I'd probably be a very happy person. It's a situation. But, and I realize that lots of horrible things are done to the poor across the world. And, you know, in this, a parent dies, another parent sells the kid into slavery. They are told to call the people who bought them like mama and papa and then something happens to them and they have to fend for themselves and they're doing great and then something happens to them and they have to fend for themselves again and they're doing fine and then i mean it's just like how many different trials and tribulations can a single individual go through and the answer is a lot but there are i can't even start on the trigger warnings there are so many y'all <laughs> just if you think you're gonna read this book please go to like Storygraph or somewhere and check the trigger warnings. I abandoned it in the middle of a scene of prison rape. That's when I was done. That's when I couldn't handle it anymore. And there's a lot. I mean, I have, I've seen a lot in this world. I've read a lot in this world. It didn't trigger me, but I just didn't want to read about it. I just didn't want to read about it. I was done. I was finished. I had already read about so much <laughs> by the time I even got to that scene. Like I said, there are so many trigger warnings in here. Sexual abuse, drug abuse, child slavery, human trafficking, poverty, 
I just can't even go through them all. I didn't even, I didn't even write them all down. As far as I think the writing was fine, I was engaged with the story. So if none of those things bother you, by all means, have a good read of Age of Ice. But like I said, I DNF'd it during a prison rape scene. And I, sh I said, I closed it and I was done. And then I moved on to a another book of the month pick, which is The Writing Retreat, which of course is a mystery thriller slash horror. I don't think it's really horror. That I didn't get it from book of the month. And then I found myself wishing I'd gotten it from book of the month. So I bought it. And now I'm wishing I hadn't bought it. In the writing retreat, aspiring author Alex seizes a rare opportunity to attend a month-long retreat at the estate of acclaimed feminist horror writer Rosa Vallo, only to find herself trapped in a deadly contest for a seven-figure publishing deal. As sinister events unfold and tensions rise with her former best friend and fellow participant, Alex must unravel the mystery behind a shocking disappearance before it's too late. This book does none of those things. It goes off the rails so fast. The first line of the book is fuck her, which doesn't offend me, but I think you're setting a tone for your book as a writer to use that. It feels like Julia Bartz tried to throw the whole kitchen sink into this book. And I just kept reading it because I thought to myself, am I really going to DNF a fifth book? And when it came time, I think I originally rated it three stars. But when it came time for me to actually sit down and write this, and I had had some time between the book and between writing this, and I went to sit down and write this, I just got angrier and angrier and angrier, and I docked it down to a one, which is really unusual for me. What I wrote in here was, well, that's a thing I read. I don't hate it. <laughs> I don't love it either. I've changed my mind. And by the time I got to the bottom, I hate it. As a first of all characters, there's a group of women, all adults, all annoyed by someone or another, all acting like spoiled, self-righteous teenagers. I just can't with adults acting like children anymore. I like an isolated setting. The history of the house is probably the best part of the book. Not the characters, not the people. The setting. The setting is the best part of the book. Hands down. It's the most interesting part of the book. It's more interesting than any of the characters. I like books about books, the writing process, etc. Meh. There is no writing competition. I mean, there is, but there's not. And then because of said, quote, writing competition, there are book within a book portions. So passages from what the characters are writing. And they're so boring. <laughs> they're just awful and it's just terrible i said also the twist was no twist the book is confused about what it wants to be and it doesn't accomplish any of them very well i should have dnf'd it but coming off four dnfs i chickened out tons of trigger warnings in here again yeah lots of them lots of them so if you think you want to read it and i don't recommend it at all i just honestly yeah I gave, if you look at my Goodreads, because, you know, I don't give them a page in here, but for the sake of my my Goodreads stats and all of that, like, some of the other books that I DNF'd, I gave two stars or three stars because they just weren't for me. Like, Age of Vice just wasn't for me. I'm the one that couldn't get through all of the violence and stuff at that point. I was just done with it. That doesn't mean the writing wasn't good. The writing was excellent. So for me to give a book a one star, yeah, that's not good. It's not good at all. Let's move on. Let me wallpaper this page and stick in a picture so that we can talk about what grim fairy tale we're going to read next. It wasn't a great reading month. And yet, you know, I finally read Lies of a Jungo and I've been wanting to read it for a long time. And I loved it. And I've been wanting to read a Silvia Moreno Garcia for a long time, and I read that, and I loved it. So, perspective. You know, I just also took the time to protect myself when I was just done with something that wasn't working for me. And sometimes I put down a book just because it's not the right time, or I get bored and my attention turns somewhere else. I think my Goodreads says that I'm still reading Way of Kings, I think, by Brandon Sanderson question mark it is a brandon sanderson book i don't know if that's the specific one 
and I'm not. And it's not that I've DNF'd it. I just checked out a reading fantasy that was just that sizable. I just didn't want to do it anymore. I was like, I need a break. I need to take a break from reading Sanderson. So sometimes I just need to take a break from a book. It is wildly unusual for me to DNF four books basically in a row. And that tells me something about my relationship with Book of the Month. And if y'all watched my video where I was brainstorming what my next reading journal is going to look like, I mentioned something along those lines. And I think we can pretty much say that at least for now, that relationship is no more. <laughs> I do have one more audiobook on there that I need to listen to, and I don't know if I cancel if I'll have access to that audiobook on the app. That book will probably pop up in my October reads because I think I'll get that read and then cancel. I'm a very mood-driven person when it comes to just about everything. I might, a year from now, half a year from now, look at what everybody else is getting from Book of the Month and go, oh, I want to do that again. I don't know, but when you DNF, how many of these were Book of the Month books? Yeah, when three of them that you DNF are Book of the Month picks and one of them that you finish but you give a one star to, whew, I don't know. And theoretically, if you read the descriptions, all of them should have worked for me. By the way, did you read Cinderella? I started to read Cinderella and then I got distracted and so then I decided to put it on the, an audio version via YouTube and I got distracted. I was working on something else and I've told y'all if I'm working on something else I can't listen to an audiobook but what I did write down about Cinderella and I think we all know the story of Cinderella is that she has unwavering kindness in the face of adversity the power of hope is a big thing in this story good deeds eventually get rewarded which is very fairy tale esque you know good deeds don't always get rewarded Loved ones can still be our guide in spirit. And then I wrote, that stepmother will hurt anyone to get to the palace. So if you've not read Cinderella, I'm just going to spoil it for you. In Cinderella, when the prince comes and is having them all try on the shoe, the stepmother chops off part of her own daughter's feet <laughs> to try to get that shoe to fit. That's where it really goes grim. On, on everyone. <laughs> you grab their tail. That stepmother will do anything. Anything. What are we going to read in October? I keep forgetting what month it is. So one of the books that I have that I really want to read is T. Kingfisher's A Sorceress Comes to Call. Which is supposedly a retelling of the Grimm Brothers Goose Girl. Hence my decision on what we're going to read this month. So that's what we're going to read. We're going to read The Goose Girl. I don't think I've ever read The Goose Girl. I've heard tell of it in pop culture and otherwise, but I don't think I've read it. Like, I'm pretty sure I haven't read it. So we're just going to stick this in here. And if you've already read The Goose Girl, or if you've already read A Sorceress Comes to Call, I've been saving it. I've been saving it for October. That's why I got to finish what I'm currently reading. It's because I've been saving it for October. Okay, so, and I just picked a color that I thought was going to go with our washi tape here. We may already have this color pink in our story lineup, but that's okay if we do. And make some bullets. And then, let's write the goose girl. What am I reading right now? I am currently reading Fairy Tale by Stephen King. I picked it because it is also on my backlist. I am doing the audiobook. I do have the physical book. My cousin has it. <laughs> I loaned it to my cousin and I haven't gotten it back from my cousin. And is Stephen a PH or a V? I don't know. I can't look that up right now. I'll write that down later. But yes. So Fairy Tale by Stephen King. I'm probably about 65% of the way through. It is my first Stephen King beyond his nonfiction book on writing. And I love on writing. I've read it twice. It's been a long time since I've read it. But as far as writing advice, like practical writing advice, it's a fantastic book. What did I say? The Goose Girl. 
Oh, look, I think this is the same color from the sea here. Oh, well. That goose girl. Put that on our card. And again, if you didn't watch my brainstorm with me on my reading journal, you would have missed. I've had to add a little flip because of Age of Vice was running into the bees, even though I DNF'd it. So I've added that in here. Everything I think is up to date in my index. We can fill in the 10 backlist. Grab this real quick. And we'll count those here in a second. I did count When a Crocodile Eats the Sun as reading a memoir. I made it, you know, far enough into the book to count it. And then I still need to read two classics by the end of the year. I still need to read another memoir by the end of the year. I need to update this. I think I'm one or two books behind. And then I think all of these are colored in. And so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Look at that. And I'm currently reading Fairy Tale. So well, I'll add another one to this list. And then I'm gonna take a break from trying to clear the backlist and read some other things that I want to read. I have also added a flip up to my series tracker, mainly because in planning for 2025, well, two reasons. One, I needed to add the Forever Desert, which is the Lies of a Jungo on here. And then I thought I need to go check my Notion database in my series database and see if I actually have all of the series on here that I'm supposed to be tracking on here. And what I ultimately decided, and for now they're on here, well, this one for sure, Threads of Power by V.E. Schwab. I've only read the first one. I still, only the first one's out, right? We don't have the second one yet. I don't think so. Question mark. And then Sansi Trilogy by Chelsea Abdullah. Red Rising and the Atlas books are all still big question marks on whether I want to finish those series. Red Rising, I really thought I was done with. I thought I was done with it. And then other people just kept saying it totally shifts tone in book two and takes, it just gets better and everything's better and the writing's better and whatever. And I'm like, mm, okay, <laughs> is it really though? So I don't know. I don't know. And then Sansu Trilogy with Chelsea Abdullah. I gave the Stardust Thief three stars. I mentioned after reading The Adventures of Amina al Sarafi that it did everything that I wished this had done. And yet I haven't wholly DNF'd it. Now I have DNF'd plenty. So while I was in there, I was looking around at some of the other series and of course Bridgerton's in there and that's a hard DNF. <laughs> Eight the Bridgerton books. There were six, seven, eight series that were hard DNFs. Um, and so I looked through the ones that I would still potentially want to finish or follow. And I added this little flip up. And what I decided was, well, I don't hate this flip up. You can still see all my decoration. So if I do my series tracker with one page, I can always add this tip in, this little flip up for next year. I don't know. I still have a lot to think about. Y'all gave me a lot to think about. I got a lot of really good advice down in the comments section. And the main thing that I took away from it, I went back and watched myself do the setup for this journal because we've been talking about me running out of space. And I said in that setup video, if I run out of space and have to move into a second journal, that's not a problem. Hear me second guessing my own advice. <laughs> Because like I said, this one's getting really tight. And this is the type of journal that I've purchased for next year is another Archer and Olive. Um, so yeah, yeah, we'll see. I'm still going to use that Archer and Olive journal for next year. On the haul, I have, oh, The Truth of the Aleke. That's the sequel or the second of uh, The Lies of a Jungo, The Truth of the Aleke. And then Rewitched by Lucy Jane Wood. I have purchased those since y'all last saw me do a video. Here's my DNF list. Look, I more than doubled it in one month. That's something else. That is something else. 
I did add the Lies of a Jingo to my favorites as well. And I had a hard time figuring out where to put it. Because <laughs> now I'm at the point where it's going to have to go up against something. I don't know. The whole situation. And then my ratings. I'm changing this. I've, I've been thinking about that a lot since I did that brainstorm. And I'm going to do something systematic. So stay tuned for that. It'll be in December. So it won't be like next week or anything. It'll be in December. And then back here. What did I add? I added Memory of the OGC. That's the third one of like the Lies of a Jungo series. And then Ashfire King, which is the second book to the Chelsea Abdullah Stardust Thief. I had to look behind me and see what the name of her book is. Like, for some reason, I can't remember it. So I've added those to my release radar for 2025. And that is it for this update for the end of September. Let me know down in the comments if you're going to read The Goose Girl with us. Hopefully I have a much better reading month and I don't spend a week or two reading books that I don't want to read. If you like this video, you know what to do. Give it a big thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't already and I will catch you in the next one.